Okay, hello and thank you for joining us in uh, for today's webinar, Keeping Your Cool in Summer Tenancy Disputes. I'm Kimberly, and I'm here with Antonella. Hi everyone. Antonella is a dispute resolution specialist with over eight years experience in all things disputes. Now today's topic incorporates your feedback and topical issues around this time of year. My favourite time of year, Ella, summer. Mine too. Now in Queensland hot summer months, we're all trying to find ways to escape the, escape the heat. It can be a frustrating time for renters and property managers or owners alike. If say, for example, the air conditioning breaks or when the pool is suddenly out of action. We also know, Ella, sometimes su summer brings financial mm. pressures, stress, and we're often so busy mm -hmm. pre and post Christmas. Now, in today's webinar, what are we going to be looking at? Today, we look at the top two summer tenancy issues. We're also going to um, talk legislative rights and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Ella, you're going to talk a lot about the options you have when there is a disagreement. Mm -hmm. And we're going to apply some self-resolution strategies to some summer dispute scenarios. Now, um, there will be an opportunity throughout today's webinar to ask questions um, and we will call for those questions or refer to some of those questions mm -hmm. as we go along. Mm -hmm. Now, if your questions aren't answered during the session and you need specific information, please call our contact centre or visit the RTA website. Now, before we get into it, I'm just going to launch a poll just so we can gauge mm. roughly who we've got out there listening today. Great. All right, so bear with me. I'll launch that poll now. So you should see on your screen which group in the rental sector do you belong to? Okay, we've got those answers coming in now. Okay, I might enter that there and close that off. Thank you everyone who answered. So I can see the largest majority of our attendees out there um, are the uh, property managers or agents. We do also of course have some landlord tallow out there to you and some tenants and other community organisations. Now in today's webinar we will talk mostly about tenants and mainly about general tenancies. So generally information covered though today um, will apply to residents and where we will talk about premises um, generally amenities or common areas should be included. Okay, so it is also really important to note, just something Ella, before we go into it, um, that the RTA does not provide legal advice. So clients should always get their own professional or legal advice about particular circumstances if necessary. Yeah. That's right. So look, let's talk about summer. Summer can mean low rainfall, extreme heat, storms or high rainfall in different areas. And Queensland being so vast, we can experience different types at the same time. The majority of tenancies, tenancies do run smoothly with little or no problems. So when it comes to summer, the top two disputes are around maintenance and repairs of pools and air conditioning. So for example, disputes that no action has been taken or the item can't be fixed or the owner just can't afford the repairs, even delays outside of either party's control. So aircon parts are in back order or there's warranty processing issues or the tradespeople are in high demand. Mm, this is a big one for this time of year, isn't it? Tradespeople. Massive. And the other type of disputes are to do with mother nature or adverse weather impacts and sometimes even natural disasters. So in some time, we do see disagreements about breaches, more specifically about special terms or obligations. For example, who should pay for watering the garden? Breaches about obligations, such as the grass is overgrown and the grass is dead or the pool is green. So you can see in the diagram your options when it comes to you and your tenant and managing party when they disagree. We always encourage self-resolution and that is the quickest way. So the RTA encourages tenants, residents and property managers and owners to try to resolve disagreements by simply talking to each other. 
also by understanding your rights and obligations and responsibilities, communicate, negotiate where you can work together to find a solution, compromise and document the outcome, and then follow up. More information about self-resolution can be found on our website or you can listen to our previous dispute resolution webinar again on our website. So Ella, what if um, you know, you've been unable to resolve the issues between yourselves? Well, the next step is where you put in the RTA's dispute resolution service or the Form 16. And dispute resolution is a voluntary and confidential process. It's where a conciliator, similar to a mediator, is an impartial third party that facilitates a constructive conversation between the two parties through a telephone conference and supports parties to generate options and come to a mutual agreement. The conciliator can also provide legislative information. Now, if the dispute is not resolved, the matter may need to proceed to the tribunal for an order to be made which is another option available to you. And that is where you can get more information at QCAT. So jump onto their website, which is www.qcat at qld.gov.au. So that one there was www.qcat.qld.gov.au. Now, QCAT um, is, as Ella mentioned, um, another option available, certainly something to consider um, with matters that are urgent and the legislation does, de um, does outline um, urgent matters or urgent applications, what constitutes those. And um, remember that some applications um, for two tribunals, say for example bonds, um, do require you to go through the RTA's dispute resolution service before applying for a hearing. Yeah, that's right. Okay, now, so we've broken down here, guys out there, um, there's some self-resolution strategies into three key strategies. Mm. So the three key self-resolution strategies, as you can see, uh, is reflection, information gathering, and negotiation. So reflection, have a look and see what has happened in the past, um, document the information. Information gathering is where you put down the the timeframes of what has happened and who was involved, and then to negotiate, to keep an open mind and come up with some clarifying issues moving forward. Absolutely, and the most important thing there is remembering the legislation, referring back to that, the chain of events, um, and what's whose responsibility is what. Mm. Now, this will be um, fleshed out in more detail when we look at those juicy summer scenarios. But most importantly, when you are working together to find a solution, it is important to be guided by the legislation. Yeah, absolutely. As we said, rights and responsibilities or obligations are outlined in sections 185 and 188 of the legislation. You should really be familiar with these and other relevant processes in the legislation. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the RTA does not interpret legislation. It is important. Um, that clients get their own or seek their own professional or legal advice about their particular circumstances where necessary. Yeah, and in certain circumstances, the Act does allow for rent decreases or compensation as outlined on the screen. A lack of communication and planning in the initial stage of repairs and maintenance can lead to disputes about loss or inconvenience. In disputes, I find that tenants or managing parties may not be aware of the impact or inconveniences caused due to a delay in repairs. So delay in repairs, you mean, for example, like you mentioned, a part on back order for an air conditioner? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So disputes about rent decreases or compensation can be avoided by working together to plan and minimise disruptions. Mm. And often having those difficult conversations up front. Yes. Okay, all right, so um, I thought I might throw it over to our listeners there in terms um, of anything, any questions they've got so far about those self-resolution strategies, maybe um, some uh, questions around some blockers they may be having with relation to attempting to resolve um, matters themselves outside of tribunal or outside of the RTA's dispute resolution service. So um, if you have any questions now, guys, I will encourage you, send them through. Okay, so we've got some questions coming through here. Um, Ella, we've, there's one here in terms of, um, you know, uh, what if nothing's being done? What if they're not returning my phone calls? So try a different approach. So if you're only calling the other party, why don't you try emailing them? And if you're dealing with an office, go and visit the office yourself. So always document where 
what you have done and which ways that you are trying to contact the other party. Absolutely, that's a great idea there. Though it is difficult, isn't there, where you feel like um, you know um, you, you you're not getting anywhere and you're really trying. I guess too something else to consider out there is have you received confirmation um, that the that your matter has been addressed or it has been seen. So um, Ella, in terms of um, you know a tenant feeling like nothing's being done, um, you know what would you suggest there? So I would then suggest to actually advise the other party of a time frame when you would like to hear from them and in what way. And if you are going on holidays or overseas, just to let the other parties know and the best way to contact you. Brilliant. Okay. Now another um, question we have here is um, so, uh, asking around reasonable timeframes for repairs. Now I guess we all know um, and we all love that ter term reasonable. I guess um, it, it, at the end of the day it's going to come down to, you know, the legislation does talk about with relation to um, remedying breaches, etc. There are specific timeframes but when there are delays outside of our control, Ella, I'm imagining it's really going to come down to how having those conversations. Absolutely, because in dispute resolutions, we talk about the concept of what is reasonable, but we all know that every person has a different definition of what reasonable is. But so again, open communication, explore what is reasonable in your situation. So as I said before, consider the what, what you're dealing with. If traders are in high demand, it may not be reasonable to get somebody there the next day. So again, the bottom line is to communicate openly with each other. Absolutely. And we've got another question here around, um, you know, having to wait where, ish, where um, you know, say for example, an air conditioner and um, there's a two week turnaround to getting somebody out. What can you do? And that question, once again, as we mentioned, what is reasonable? Um, I guess it's about, uh, you know, considering alternatives. If if your hands are tied and that time frame is out of your control, working with the tenant, is there an interim solution or having those conversations like you mentioned Ella about you know compensation or considerations for these things um, you know up front. Exactly and I think we're going to touch on that in the next scenario that we're going to share Absolutely. with you. Absolutely thank you so much for sending your questions in there. There are some other questions I can see here that will be covered off in the scenarios and if you feel that they're not um, we can also talk um, about the particular things if time permits at the end. It's great to see everybody interacting out mm, there. Absolutely thanks guys. Okay. All right, well, how about we move on to our first summer scenario? Now, let's consider it. A new lease has been signed for 12 months back in October last year. In December, the tenant suffered heat stress and was hospitalised. The tenant feels the main bedroom is just too hot for her health condition and the owner should install air conditioning into that bedroom. The body corporate recently upgraded the fence from a wooden fence to a colour bond outside that bedroom and the tenant thinks this is making the room hotter mm. also. The unit does have ceiling fans in all bedrooms and air conditioning in the lounge room. Mm. Now we know, first of all, as we've mentioned, the key to self-resolution is to know your rights and obligations and that core strategy there, that reflecting. So um, I, I, I don't know about you, Ella, but what about we throw it out to the group? I reckon Let's I'm going to throw it out to the group to yep. see what you think around rights and responsibility. Mm. So everyone out there, do you think that it is the lessor in this particular scenario, is it the lessor's responsibility? Okay, we've got some people coming in there. All right, I might close off that poll. Thank you to everyone who responded. Now, um, the majority out there say no. 79% of you out there say no, it is not the lessor's responsibility um, to install air conditioning in that main bedroom. What are your thoughts, Ella? Well, the, considering uh, section 185, the answer is no. The lessor's obligations during a tenancy. The tenancy did not start with an air conditioner in the main bedroom, so therefore there is no obligation for the owner to install an air conditioner. The tenancy legislation talks about heating but not cooling. So the lessor is not in breach of a law dealing with issues about the health or safety with 
relation to cooling the home for a tenant. So often people can confuse work health and safety with tenancy or council laws. So imagine if you are the agent, how do you proceed knowing this information? Mm, that's the tough part, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, sure, you can tell the tenant, yeah, sorry, it's not our problem, but what will happen then? The tenant is raising a problem, and what if there is no solution discussed? Again, the key to self-resolution is stopping and assessing the situation and being open-minded. Now, Ella, drawing on your experience in dealing with disputes like these, um, what are some things that the listeners out there could consider? Well, in this case, um, have a look at the facts. Everyone agrees that there have been changes to the premises, the fence and the tenant's health. Ask yourself, well, what are the desired outcomes? What is the tenant trying to achieve and what is the owner prepared to do? Also, what am I prepared to compromise in? And That's keep, a big one for it is, tenants as well. It is, to keep an open mind and the what ifs. In this situation, an air conditioner could be installed and rent increased, or the tenant could swap bedrooms, or a window cover put on the window to block reflection of the fence, or even mutual agreement leading to mutual termination. Agreeing that the tenant can't stay and the owner understands her situation has changed and her life is at risk. Essentially, they work together. And of course, remembering back to your options, if the attempts have been unsuccessful, you can always put in that re um, request for dispute resolution with the RTA. Mm. Okay, moving on to another scenario now. Um, little, little or no rain um, or water restrictions does main, make maintaining yard and grass increasingly harder. I, I don't know, I feel like I'm. it's an uphill battle in mm, summertime. No. Um, now let's take a look at this particular mother mother nature related scenario. So um, prestige property. So at the beginning of the tenancy, the grass was established, the gardens were thriving. Mm -hmm. The home has a 10,000 litre rainwater tank. It's summer and the grass and gardens are dying. Now the tenant says this is because there's just no rainwater for them to use and it's unreasonable to expect them to pay for water to keep the yards alive. Mm, yeah. So generally regular household jobs in the yard, such as mowing and weeding the garden, are considered part of the tenant's obligation to keep the premises clean and undamaged. Tenants are not required to have any specialised knowledge about gardening. Firstly, it is important to look at the agreement. More specific details may actually be outlined in the special terms. Yeah, so special terms, um, they are negotiable and should be discussed prior to signing a tenancy agreement. Now, special terms um, cannot require a tenant or resident to purchase particular goods or services. Yeah, if there are issues about water in gardens, refer to your local council water restrictions. The tenant may not be held responsible if laws, trees or other plants die because they comply with local laws. Also too, um, it might be time to look at those um, special terms and see if they need to be reconsidered. Say for example, what happens if there is no rainwater for the yards? Mm. Was this outlined yeah. in those special terms? Well, property managers, you can look out for signs early at your next inspections and for tenants to report damage or changes. So it stops you from meeting your responsibilities straight away. Really important, being proactive is key. So let's think about this. A nice looking yard helps increase the value of the home. There's no disputing that. So that's helping the owner. And it also improves the aesthetics or the feel of a home for a, a house proud tenant. Yeah, that's right. So the tenant might want the yards looking nice just as much as the owner. Turf and plants can be costly, we know that, for the owner to establish or the tenants to replace. So it's about generating options. Don't let this turn into a bond dispute and don't wait until the yards are past the point of no return. So what are some things to consider? Well, who's responsible? What about the short-term or long-term issues? No one can tell when the drought may be finished, when the next rainfall will occur. Is this just a summer issue? Exactly. And what are some of the practical solutions? Again, think outside of the box. You can together make up your own rules. And it's a time to renegotiate. Possible outcomes could be that the owner sends a landscaper around to look at the ways of preserving the grass and gardens, fertilising or different plants for drought affected times. The owner could install another tank or see if more water can be captured when it rains again 
or they both agree that the yards will not be returned the same at the end of the tenancy due to factors outside the tenant's control. Well, the tenant and lesser or the agent can actually negotiate water consumption costs. For example, the lesser agrees to pay for a certain amount of water if the tenant maintains the gardens to a certain standard. And this is where you could include this type of scenario um, or agreement in the special terms of the tenancy agreement. Mm. Okay, now on to a really topical um, natural disaster related scenario. Um, I know Ellie you mentioned earlier, drought. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about drought and water. So in this particular scenario, the tenant is responsible for water. Okay, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and is that's outlined in the agreement that the house is water efficient, etc. Mm -hmm. um, there are tanks at the property, there's no town water supply. Now the tenant uses water wisely, there's no disputing that. Mm -hmm. And the tenant has been paying for water to be tanked in for months. Mm -hmm. The tenant has contacted um, the, the owner or the managing party um, to say they've lost their job and they cannot afford to pay for any more water next time it runs out. Mm. Terrible. All right, so let's have a look. And what does the legislation say? We know the weather is ultimately outside of either party's control, so areas of the legislation to consider are if the agreement states that the tenant must pay for water and the premises is water efficient, the lesser agent can pass full consumption costs to the tenant. So this is the case in this scenario. Yeah, so if the lesser provider, tenant or resident believes they would suffer excessive hardship, if the agreement was not terminated, they may make an urgent application to the tribunal to end the tenancy. Well, lesser's agents are responsible for ensuring the premises are, to fit, are fit to live in. What a dilemma, Ella. I mean, the tenant, they're sticking their hand up. They're saying, I cannot afford to buy any more water. Mm. You know, big questions. Does this make this property unlivable if there's no water and the tenant stays on? Yeah. Is the tenant going to be suffering excess hardship? Are they currently, you know, in excessive hardship? Well, potentially, but again, the RTA cannot determine this. In this situation, I would encourage people to consider the what ifs again think outside of the box. What are the desired outcomes? Does a tenant want to end the tenancy? Is ending the tenancy an option? Has the tenancy run smoothly up until now? Is the owner happy with the tenant? What about the short-term or long-term considerations? The drought may be long-term, but the loss of income may, may not be. Is there an interim solution? It's possible outcomes. So now the owner now pays for the water or the rent increases to include water consumption in smaller, more manageable payments. What about mutual termination or property managers? You could suggest that the tenant contact assistive services for water or financial assistance. Common disagreements seen after natural disasters events include disputes about non-livability of the premises or how or if the tenancy ended. It's often a big one, isn't it? Huge, again. These lead to bond disputes about rent payments and etc. Now, when an entire community is affected or homes lost, offices lost, emotions are, they're, they're at their highest, aren't they? Of course, it's completely natural. Often tenants may have nowhere to go, jobs are lost, and there is a huge demand for tradespeople and disaster recovery. Self-resolution is crucial when natural disasters are concerned. Often decisions need to be made quickly about safety and everyone should act in good faith. The Act says, notice for non-livability must be given. The managing party is responsible for repairs to bring the property back to a livable condition. The tenant is responsible for removing or cleaning their own possessions. And if the tenant doesn't leave, an application can be made to tribunal for a termination. So where there are negotiations about entry or determining an agreement end date in major events such as natural disasters. Empathy, communication and patience are critical. Absolutely and that's where you know you mentioned earlier Elliot, that the disputes arise. It's those um, you know negotiations about entering repair people um, or determining when the event or what the event was caused the you know the property to be unlivable yeah. or what exactly is you know um, unlivable. Exactly. All these things. Yeah exactly. 
So the, again, the property manager and the owner and the tenant should talk to each other as soon as possible to discuss the state of the property and work out what action needs to be taken. So Ella, in this instance, let's imagine there's been a cyclone, what things should be considered? First of all, is it safe? You don't want to put anyone's lives in jeopardy. The other thing is, can it be repaired? What are the costs and what are the timeframes? And again, the desired outcomes, mutual termination. Do you stay for now with the intention of the tenancy ending for major repairs to be made and then move back in, stay for good? Take into consideration what the insurance provider is required of you to do as well. Okay, now we've all seen the effects of a recent, um, the recent bushfires. Um, you know, it, it is really important. We have talked about being proactive. So with relation to um, bushfires um, or any natural type disaster, you know, if you haven't already in the lead up to summer, it's not too late to do health checks. Check out the guttering, look for overgrowth. Are there fallen branches? Working hoses, are mm. hoses working? That's mm. a good one, you know, big one for tenant. Um, outdoor taps. Um, um, is the pro is the property fitted with outdoor taps? Are they working? Um, big one too, exchanging details. So do you have everybody's emergency contact details up to date? Have you shared them? Is is everybody insured correctly? What mm. are those insurer details? Mm. Certainly in times of natural disaster where insurance companies are coming out, it might be important for tenants to be aware of the owner's um, you know, insurance company and what mm. have you or their details. Also another one too is thinking about moving towards um, you know, electronic um records. Mm. Um, you know, getting things in writing in terms of maybe perhaps um, you know, uh, via on email so you can pull those. Tenants having a copy of your mm -hmm. lease agreement electronically so you can check mm -hmm. what your agreement states. Um, now, it, the RTA um, has created a comprehensive fact sheet on natural disasters, which is available on our website. It covers all the essentials, including what to do if a rental property is damaged or becomes unlivable after a natural disaster, ending a tenancy, rent reductions, repairs and refunds. For customers who require tailored information, and especially where our customers have lost internet access during or in the aftermath of a natural disaster, our contact centre is open Monday to Friday during business hours to provide that tailored support. As part of the RTA's response to natural disasters, the RTA can, where appropriate, support our customers through tailored actions. So this could mean prioritising phone calls and dispute resolution requests for dis disaster affected areas, um, pausing by on refund notices to parties in disaster affected areas um, where the postal service may be impacted, mm -hmm. providing information um, or updating our website, mm -hmm. um, providing on the ground support, um, which for example, um, through the rental recovery hub in Townsville, um, the RTA was involved with that one after the 2019 Queensland flood disaster. Now, um, I did want to throw to some questions before we go. We are running um, close to that, that 30 minute mark. I am um, you know, aware that everybody may have other places to be. So if you can stay on the line, that'd be great. Um, we will answer some more questions. Um, but before we conclude our webinar, um, don't forget the options available to you. So self-resolution, we know that's the fastest and you can have control of the outcome. It is important to also remember your rights and responsibilities. And if you need more information, access the RTA's website or call the contact centre on 1300 366 311. Mm. But if you are unable to resolve a summer dispute or any dispute, you can download a dispute resolution request form from the RTA's website or contact the RTA to have a copy mailed to you. Now communication, we know that's key and it can be in many forms. So make sure you're having those conversations to determine what is the best method for you and the other person. Don't forget to be clear and communicate your desired outcomes or expectations. Self-resolution does require compromise. And I know Ella, you mentioned it before, an open mind. Definitely. If you practice these strategies, hopefully everyone can get back into enjoying summertime. Nice. All right, okay, just a few questions now. Having a look here, guys, thank you for staying with us if you're still there, out there. Um, okay, so we've got um, questions around air conditioning. I did see a question too um, around 
um, yeah, and some managing parties out there um, receiving letters from the council um, in terms of grass cutting. I guess it's going to come back to, you know, having consideration. Often, Ella, we do see people, um, you know, j jumping straight into breaches and then those breaches, um, you know, being disputed and what have you coming through to dispute resolution. In summertime, often um, the grass is growing, you know, if it's raining and, and, and the conditions are, are wet, we know the grass is often very hard to stay on top of. So obviously having those conversations with the tenants, um, people may be away. So being aware too that, you know, um, people may be going away on holidays or what have you. But of course, tenants on the flip side, if you are going away and, and, and it's about being proactive, preempting what to do if you are away for a longer amount of time, and especially if the grass is, is growing, you know, sort of, um, you know, overnight, so to speak. So being conscious of, um, it really comes back down to that, the self-resolution, what is is um, occurring for the tenant maybe to not be, um, you know, attending to that grass in a timely manner. Now, um, in terms of air conditioning and who's responsible for cleaning and servicing, um, I guess in terms of, um, you know, going back to the tenant's obligation, so not being required to be a specialist in a field, we mentioned that in terms of gardening um, and uh, with air conditioning, it would be keeping, making sure that the air conditioner is not being damaged um, and keeping it, um, you know, making sure it's running properly and reporting any um, issues you may have there. Also a good idea to have those conversations. If you don't, um, you know, agree to um, something that is requested of you is having those conversations, um, referring to the legislation and the lease agreement, what's listed um, in your, um, the special terms of the property and also contacting the RTA. Um, let's have a look here. Big questions around rent decreases. Um, what is reasonable? Uh, obviously, the RTA, um, you know, cannot determine what is a reasonable amount. Um, you know, I guess the first step is um, everybody coming to the party and recognising that maybe there is a need for a rent decrease. Um, certainly, that's a that you know, it's great that everybody has got to that point. Um, once again, Ella. What are you thinking in terms of it's going to come down to negotiation, but also doing your research? So where could they look? Um, RTA, I, I suppose they could look at um, comparing other properties. Uh, yeah, other properties. On the rental market, like for like. Absolutely. And it always boils down to having an open communication. And we don't know what the tenant's financial situation is. So it's sometimes just putting everything out on the table um, and communicating expectations. So again, the RTA can't say what uh, specific amount people should increase or decrease, but by just coming to an agreement that both parties can agree with and can live with. We always say that it may not be a decision that everyone's happy about, but it's something that everyone can live with. So again, boils down to just communicating with with each other, each other's perspectives. Yes, yeah, certainly, um, you know, determining those compensation amounts and those, um, you know, rent decreases or rent increase amounts too, if, if there's, um, you know, a, air condition is added to a property, for example, um, determining those amounts is something that really is going to come down to um, negotiation um, and, and research, absolutely. Okay, so that um, we're going to have to wrap it up there. Now, I do ask, um, we will end the webinar shortly. Please stay on the line. I'll end the webinar at my end, but once I do that, if you could stay on, there will be a short survey. Um, the RTA really values your feedback, and we do review all of your questions and feedback received during the webinars to help inform the content of following um, future webinars and um, our messaging on our website. Um, now, as I said, a short post survey will pop up on your screen once I close the webinar. Um, but firstly, I, I don't know about you, Ella, I've, I, I love this. I love discussing this type of stuff um, and, and I've enjoyed uh, fleshing out these scenarios today. Me too, Kimmy. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thank you for coming, guys. Um, thank you. Um, I hope you have um, found this today's webinar to be useful. Um, as I said, don't forget to visit the website or call the RTA. The details are on the screen now. Um, I will end the webinar.